Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church Rosenberg Adult Bible Study. Today we'll be uh, working in Philippians chapter 3. Uh, the verses that we'll be focusing on are 8 through 21. We're going to cover a little bit more than that to just kind of get the feel of it, but uh, uh, that's what we'll be working on today. So if you want to find Philippians chapter 3 uh, to read along, you know, please do that now. Let's start today though with a prayer. Lord, we thank you for everything that you do for us, for loving us, for providing all of our, our needs for us. And Lord, we, we are thankful for this, this time and opportunity to come and study your word. And as our lesson title is uh, today, joy in knowing you, well, Lord, that's hopefully uh, something that we'll gain a greater appreciation for as we work through our lesson today. So open our minds, open our hearts, and uh, Lord, I know you're with us as we study this lesson. We thank you for your son Jesus in our lives, and we pray all that in his name. Amen. Okay, Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to start today by, uh, by having you consider a, a, a few questions. First question being, uh, do you know why God put you where you are right now, right this moment? Why has God put you where you are right now? And, uh, you know, do you ever think that it, it's just by chance that you are where you are? Or do you believe that there, uh, there is a larger uh, purpose at work in your life? Maybe you could think of that question in a, in a little different way. And you can think about everything that's going on in, in your life. And then think of it in the terms of what will you have to show for your life when you stand before Jesus? Is it going to be uh, you have a good job, you have lots of friends, uh, uh, you have a college degree, a large reputation, uh, got money in the bank, you had a successful career? What is in your life that is your life? in your eyes. If it's those kind of things, not that any of those in and themselves are bad, but if those kind of things are all that you have to show for your life, then we probably don't have as much going for us as we think in God's eyes. Sooner than many of us think, we'll be standing in, in front of God and all the things of life that we treasure now so many of those things will not matter at all. Somebody else will have our money. Somebody else will have our job. Uh, any fame and glory that we'll have will have faded away or disappeared. And everything that we own uh, will uh, likely belong to others. And somebody else will even be sitting in our pew at church. Everything here is going to be different when we're standing in front of God. And to find the joy in knowing Jesus, we, we have to understand of what is important in God's eyes and, and how we should form and live our life, because that is where the real joy is. It's not all the accomplishments of life. Not that they're bad, but they are if we miss the joy in knowing Jesus. Maybe we could also think of it this way. There are really two things in our world that are kind of eternal. The Word of God is eternal. And people who have taken the advantage offered for the opportunity of eternal life with God, that's eternal. So if you think of it in those terms, then it only makes sense to build our life around the things that will last forever. The Word of God will last forever. People who have accepted God's gift of grace will last forever. Everything else disappears. As we read this, I think the Apostle Paul would agree that life's goal is to, is to go to heaven and to take as many people with us as possible. In general, that's, that's how he lived his life. Service to God and take as many people with him as he could. 
that being said, then the real purpose of this life is to find joy in serving God and to advance his causes uh, in, in this world. In reality, I think in God's eyes, the other things are secondary. As we know, once the Apostle Paul met Jesus on the road to, to uh, Damascus, his life was radically and utterly transformed. His values were literally turned upside down. And everything he was, everything he took pride in, was different once he met God. Everything that was so important to him, everything he had built his life around, when he compared it with the joy of knowing Jesus, all those other things were nothing. So as we go through the lesson today, take some time to think about this question. What do you put your effort into achieving? Where do you find your joy? And where will you be when you get to where you're going? And that's in front of God on Judgment Day. So let's get into uh, today's lesson. As I mentioned, Philippians chapter 3. Just to get a little background and kind of set up for the verses that we'll actually read, uh, you can look through them when you have the opportunity. But in the first three verses of chapter 3, it, it begins with kind of a pretty stern warning about uh, false teachers that had uh, infiltrated the church at Philippi. And Paul wanted to make sure that the congregation knew how to handle them. And that's what he's talking about in the early part of, of chapter 3. In my mind, they were, they, were, they were saying that you had to keep the law of Moses in order to be saved, among the many things that, that they were saying. As we know, Paul had a different message. And then you read a little further in, in verses 4 through 6, he goes on to talk about his background. His background as a... Uh, uh, with his uh, uh, Jewish education, his high social standing, his reputation for keeping the law, his reputation for moral purity. And he talks about all those things that he was and all those things that he focused his life around. And in a way, those verses read like, what more could you want than all the things that I already had? And then that's the point of where we're going in today's message. He had all those things that so many people would put high value on. But as he's going to talk, well, what's the point of all those things? All those things is good. All those things are good. But it's one of those things where good is not good enough. And that takes us to where we'll start reading today. So we're going to start reading in Philippians chapter 3. We're going to start with verse 7. And we'll, uh, we'll work our way from there. So we're going to read 7 through 11. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus, Christ Jesus in my, my Lord. And for, for those sake, I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and he found in him not having a righteous righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is, is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Jesus, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. You got to remember, Paul had all these things going for him, who he was before. But now what he's saying is that all those things are garbage compared to knowing Jesus Christ. So Paul considers his life like before and after coming to Christ. He does kind of, in my mind, it's kind of a little mental accounting is what he's doing in these verses to kind of, I have this on the prophet side and this on the law side. On the prophet side, he puts, he just uses the term, the prophet of all this is Christ. That's where I win. On the law side, it's all those things he mentioned before that are of no value 
because they have nothing to do with knowing Christ. Now, how does he come to that conclusion? Well, he calls them garbage. No matter how it, it, it looks from the outside, he considers all those things garbage. As I mentioned earlier, it's not that any of those things are wrong in themselves, but they were nothing to him because it took he took an inordinate pride in them. He looked down on others because of them. He evaluated everything in light of them. And in the end, those were the, we'll call them human things, he had put in front of everything else until he came to know Jesus. So if you think about that and the things that you put great pride in, where will you be when you, when you get to his point of being in front of God? When you finally come to the end of your life, what will you have to show for the years you were put on this earth? Jesus asked kind of that question in Mark chapter 8. He said, What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Like I said, it's not that anything that you accomplish and achieve in life is bad in itself. It's where the focus is and how it takes you away from God. I think that's what Paul is talking about here. All these things I had, it took me away from Jesus. Now that I know Jesus, my focus is on doing the things that bring me closer to him because that's where I find my joy. Now, I think we could all agree that there are a lot of people that call themselves Christians and in a way they're kind of like amateur Christians. They may have... Um, heard the phrase a uh, mile wide and an inch deep they're 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 following they go to church every week and they, they claim they're following Jesus but it's more of a hobby it's not being a Christian is not for the weak and uh, it's not easy uh, to put all your hope in Jesus and turn away from the earthly things that distract you from that and I think what happens is a lot of people don't understand the commitment it takes in life to be a Christian. Paul understood that. Look at Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Jesus Christ took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win, the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I think there's some principles here that uh, we can think about that Paul, I think, is pointing at pointing out to us. In verses 12 and 14 again, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Paul understood that he was not where he wanted to be yet. He was working on it, but he was not there yet. It's kind of pretty honest admission. I'm not there yet. Um, he didn't have any real problem admitting his shortcomings. He isn't perfect yet, and he knows it. And it, I think that's a principle that we ought to all understand. We're not where we need to be where it comes to, to knowing and, and embracing the Lord. There's always work to be done. And it's all, in my mind, it's, um, it's keeping moving in the direction that we need to go. And I think in, in a spiritual sense, direction makes all the difference. True believers aren't in heaven yet, but they aim everything they do in that direction. So direction is everything. If you want to win the race, like he's talking about, the race that's right before us, 
we have to admit that we're not there yet understand the direction we need to go and make sure that we're moving in God's direction and focus on that and focus on the finish line we just had the Olympics you know sprinters that are, are racing to a, a goal with their eyes are trained on the finish line and they run towards that finish line and that's where their focus is if they're looking around there's a chance somebody will go right by them. So it's important to us to realize that direction makes the difference. And we have to understand what the goal is, focus in that direction, and don't take our eyes off the goal. Verse 15 says, All of us, when who are mature, should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my examples, brothers and sisters, and just as you have as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. So the first principle, as I said, is, is that we just kind of keep our eyes on that goal and understand that we're not there yet and we have to do everything that we can to achieve the goal. I think what, what he's saying here, when he's saying, follow my example, he's not saying, hey, go achieve all the things that I've achieved in the past. I think what he's saying is, when he says, follow my example, he's saying, now, look at, at, at how I am striving towards the goal and follow my example now. Use me as a model if you have to, and keep your eyes on those who live as we do. I think what he's saying is that we should follow faithful leaders. So who, who are we following? There's things to learn from faithful leaders. In my mind, it's kind of like who is up ahead of us on this journey that we're on, and who is up in front showing the way, pointing out the rough places along the road, and making sure that we don't make a wrong turn. There are faithful people out there who can help us on our journey. So it's, in essence, one way. Who are we following, helping us on our journey to Jesus? But we also have to also think that there are people behind us, looking at us, who are following us, using us as the example. I think you can, in essence, look behind you and you would see faces behind you of people who are following you. There's a responsibility there to make sure that those following us are following Jesus. And we have to understand the responsibility that we have as Christians to be that example and in the direction that we're going. As just as there was people before us, like Paul, who says, follow my example, that we should be the example for the people who are behind us. We need to keep on the path. We need to keep our eyes on the prize. And there are plenty of examples in Scripture, and I would dare to say in our life today, of people that we could follow on our journey to make sure that we stay focused on where we need to be. Look at verses 18 and 19. For I, as I have offered, often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. So we need to know our direction. To get the joy of Christ, we need to know our direction. There are people that, that we can have examples that we can follow, like Paul and, and everyday examples that we can follow that keep us focused and not forget that there are people following us. And that third principle is that we have to know that there are distractions and enemies out there. So we have to, since we must follow faithful leaders and understand that people are behind us, Paul says he calls them enemies of the cross of Christ. I think he's talking about both people inside the church and outside of the church. 
inside the church, people maybe who claim that they're Christians, but they're a distraction to the faithful. Not every relationship that we deal with is good for us, and we have to recognize that. Some people will just, in essence, be pulling us away from Christ. We need to know our enemies. There's really no other way to win the prize and stay focused in the direction that we need to go. So we need to know our enemies. And our enemies are those whose their mind is set on earthly things. Now look at verses 20 and 21. But our citizenship is in heaven... And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so they will be like his glorious body. So that brings us to the fourth principle. We have to, we're not where we need to be. We need to keep our eyes on the direction we need to go. We know that there are enemies out there, but we also need to remember our true identity as Christians. Our citizenship is in heaven as believers in Christ. We live on earth, but our hearts are in essence in heaven. He lists us two pieces of evidence that of our citizenship to heaven. One is that we're eager for Jesus to return uh, to the earth, return to earth. It's not that we're all eager to die, but we know Jesus is coming back and we're eager for that. And the second thing that is kind of evidence of our heavenly citizenship is that we know that we will go through a transformation when Jesus returns from who we are today, our earthly bodies, to our heavenly existence. That's kind of our passport, our identity as Christians. We believe in those things. So as, as you kind of, to close this up, as you think about Paul and what he's telling us today is that we should have a sense of joy in knowing that we can win the prize. We can make that destination if we know we're not there yet and we have work to do to get there, that there are faithful examples for us to follow of how to make that journey. We know that there are stumbling blocks along the way. There are enemies to try to keep you, so to speak, from that destination. And remember that we all have our true identity. Paul called it citizenship. Our citizenship is in heaven. And that is what our true identity is. And since that is our identity, that is how we should live. I'd ask you to, to go and think about today's lesson and, 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 and really think about day to day. Where is your focus? And what will you have to show for your life when you stand before in front of God? And the earthly things that have no value or the things that have value in God's eyes. Let's pray. Lord, thanks again for loving us. Thank you for your son Jesus in our lives and that we go out today and that we live to succeed in the journey towards you. This is in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.